All right, well, welcome everyone. Um, this is Bell da Costa Green, um, the Mor Pierpont Morgan's first librarian and the first director of the Morgan Library and Museum. Oh no, there we go. Um, just a little bit of background about the Morgan Library. Um, J. Pierpont Morgan was a banker um, and he built his private library um, between 1902 and 1906, which houses a remarkable collection of art, manuscripts, books, a wide array of things, which then became was given to the city of New York in 1924 by his son, J.P. Morgan Jr., often referred to as Jack, which is how I will refer to him um, throughout this presentation. Um, and here's just a quick look at how the Morgan looks today with the outside of our recently renovated um, McKim Library, which was the original library built, um, finished in 1906, and the inside, which is our one of our most famous rooms in the McKim, the East Room. Um, and so the woman we're talking about today, Belle de Costa Green, I've had the opportunity to process um, her professional papers at the Morgan, which is where we get the most of our information that I'll be talking about today, just to give you a kind of inside peek at the work we're doing here at the Morgan. Um, you see that we took all of the papers from these huge file boxes and put them into these wonderful archival boxes, um, equaling to around 108 boxes, thousands of letters that we've been able to read of hers and learn about her work at the Morgan. Um, and I'm going to just point out that with archival work and Belle Green, they tell us a lot about her, but there's also a lot of things we don't know about her. These are just some examples right now on the screen of different letters that we have um, come across through our research about Belle DaCosta Green. But at the end of the day, we don't know everything about her um, and we're okay with that. So as I go through this presentation, I will say when there are facts we don't know or facts that we have a ton on, um, and then feel free at the end to ask me any questions that might not have been answered or that you want to know if we do know the answers to about who she is. Um, so Belle da Costa Green um, was born November 26, 1879. Um, she was born as Belle Marion Greener to Richard T. Greener and Genevieve Ida Fleet in Washington, D.C. The, on, the, on your screen, you'll see that what we first knew as the earliest known photo of Belle Green in 1910 by Ernest Histed, but we've actually just recently come across what we think is an even earlier photo that once we get permissions to share, we will gladly share with the world because it's not from our institution, but from 1900 when she was in library school. So keep your eyes on the radar for that um, photo to come. Also on the screen is a photo of her father, Richard T. Greenham. Um, unfortunately, we do not have a photo of her mother, Genevieve, but we do um, have this pamphlet where she is listed um, as working on this um, church fair held at the 15th Street Presbyterian Church. What most people know Belle Green's father for is he is the first African American to graduate from Harvard College. Um, he was an activist, he was a lawyer teacher, librarian, many, many things. Um, and it wasn't until the biographer of J.P. Morgan, Jean Strauss, um, was doing work on J.P. Morgan in the late 1990s, came across Belle da Costa Green's birth certificate that she linked Belle, Green, Belle da Costa Green with Richard T. Greener. Um, and this is when we first um, actually found out that Belle Green was a woman of color who had been passing as white when she was working at the Morgan Library. So part of my job at the Morgan is to do a lot of research on Belle Green and her background, especially the early childhood background um, of what was like for her, for her before moving to New York City. Um, and so, like I said, she was born in Washington, DC. Um, and this, the 15th Street Presbyterian Church plays a very large role in understanding the Green family 
They were active members of this church. The minister was Francis J. Grimke, who is a famous abolitionist. Um, he is the nephew of the Grimke sisters out of Philadelphia, who were white abolitionists who had moved from South Carolina because they didn't agree with their family's role in slavery. So Francis Grimke was the minister at the 15th Street Presbyterian Church when the Greener family attended. Um, he would be the minister who would baptize Green within the church. And some of its prominent members included Elizabeth Keckley, who is Mary Todd Lincoln's seamstress, and Blanche K. Bruce, who is one of the first African-American members of representatives during the Reconstruction era. And so the family is a very prominent family within the DC area, but they will move to New York City by 1888 um, for Richard's work. Um, you see on the top is an 1880 census where you can see Richard T. Greener. He's in the second box here um, where they actually are being listed as white, um, which is one of the first inklings that we get that the family did pass before Green started working at the Morgan, which is um, a lot of people think that she began to pass as a way to get her job, but that was not the case. The family was passing before this. Um, so they'll move to New York City in 18 by 1888. And by 1898, Richard T. Greener and Genevieve are divorced. And what you'll see on the bottom is the 1905 census, where we have Genevieve being listed as Genevieve Van Vliet. We do know that it is Genevieve who makes the decision to fully pass as white of Portuguese descent um, and move the family in that direction. Once they're in New York City, the children just follow along with their mother. Um, and in Green, one of the schools she attends is the Northfield Academy, um, where we do know that she was listed as being mixed. The, um, the school believed that her mother was white and that her father was black. And this is a brief timeline of what kind of happened, Green's career um, here at the Morgan. What I failed to have on this screen is where she was before the Morgan. Um, from, she attends Northfield in the late 1890s. She'll attend library school for a summer. Um, at Amherst College, and then she will take a cataloging job at Princeton University sometime around 1902, and that's where she'll meet Junius Spencer Morgan, Pierpont Morgan's nephew, and he will introduce Green and Morgan, and that's how she will interview for the position of librarian at the Morgan, and she will then come on in 1905, um, and between 1905 to 1913, she serves as Pierpont Morgan's librarian. Um, this is, she'll catalog his entire collection. She'll actually help finalize the plans with the construction of the library in its last stages, um, possibly adding the second and third row tier of bookshelves. Um, when he dies in 1913, his son Jack will take over the library and she will serve as his librarian from 1913 to 1924. And then she helps steward the transition from a private library into a public institution. We get a lot of questions of what does it mean for the Morgan to have gone public? It just means that they are required to hold public exhibitions, to allow for the public to have opportunities to come in and interact with that collection. It is not a public institution in the way that the Danbury Public Library or the NYPL is a public library where you can go and lend objects as we still have to be stewards to the collection of these amazing artifacts. So it can't just be come in and play as much as Green actually kind of loved that mentality. Um, so in 1924, we go public. In 1928, um, she helps oversee the expansion of the library into what was the Pierpont Morgan house becomes annex space and becomes our exhibition and reading room, which would be how that space up until 2003, when the reading room would get moved into a new piece of building structure that was built. And now the annex serves as all of our exhibition space at the Morgan. 
1948, she announces her retirement. And then in 1949, the Morgan will hold um, an exhibition honoring her legacy and everything she contributed to the Morgan over her time. And she'll pass away in 1950. Um, so these are just some items that we have. This room here with the table was Green's office. It's the North Room. The Morgan, her North Room office never looked this clean. This was a press image um, done in 1928. Uh, she was notoriously messy, known for having papers all over her desk. Um, and these are just some of the papers that would have been on her desk. We have, through our work, found, you know, all of the documentation of how she ran the Morgan. So this is an account book in her name, in her hand, um, doing Christmas bonuses for Man at the Library, salaries. We also have, in the bottom of the screen, have one of her paychecks. And what is really interesting about Belle Green's paycheck that I love to point out to people is she is a woman working in the 1920s and getting to sign her own paychecks. Green really is a pioneer um, in women's special collections librarianship. She's one of the first to be a director to, and one of the first to have a lot of control over a lot of money. Uh, there are newspaper articles at this time talking about the highway rate, bleh, excuse me, high wage and pay that she got. I actually had somebody do the math for me um, that from this paycheck, she was making around $240,000 a year, which I mean, I wish librarians got paid that much today. That would be amazing. But she really was seen as a force in the special collections field and really had the trust of the Morgans with this collection from the time she started and so this is still fairly early on in her career in 1921 you can see just from this paycheck the amount of trust that the morgans had in her in overseeing this collection um so i'm just going to share with you a couple of her most prized pieces that she acquired during her time here. Um, and on the bottom is a quote, JP is so well trained now that he rarely ever buys a book or manuscript without consulting me by cable or letter first. This is true. We have so many cables going back and forth between Green and either Pierpont Morgan or more often Jack Morgan, because most of her career is with Jack, where she'll say, oh, I see this, we should buy this for this much money. Or they'll be like, oh, what do you think of this piece? She really was so integral in forming these collections that we still house today. Um, one of the most famous is the, all the way, I think it's on, it's my left, hopefully it's on your left, it's this first acquisition here, which is the um, Sir Thomas Mallory Caxton. Um, this was a really famous acquisition that she made it made all the headlines. We paid 42000 for this piece at the time, and it was an astounding amount of money to pay for an, one of the earliest printed Caxtons um, out of England. And she is famous for having been at this auction house, and it said that the plume of her hat waved um, to as she was bidding on it, um, which is just a lovely piece of imagery that we get um, from these newspaper articles about these acquisitions. The next is we have the Biotis. I always pronounce that wrong. That's the second one there. This is probably one of our most requested um, during her time there for being loaned out or being um, copied. It is a really important piece of commentary on the apocalypse. Um, third, I have on this screen is the Grande manuscript. And what I did by Balzac, what is amazing about this manuscript is we have a wonderful passage with Green commenting that she loves being able to see the writing process. She doesn't want what's called fair copy manuscripts. She wants ones that are look like this really you know written all over and crossed out because she loves seeing the creative process and i think that speaks a lot to green and who she was and her love for artists and writers and just living within the all of these documents and seeing how they came about and the roles they would play in shaping future scholars next we have the Anne Holt morgan gospels um which was purchased, one of her last purchases, second to last purchase in 1948. You can see it's a beautiful illuminated manuscript. 
And Green is well known for being a medievalist. Her passion and really her knowledge base was in illuminated manuscripts. And Green was somebody who really found it important and was really humble that when she didn't know something, she would seek the experts on it, which most people don't know about her. We have hundreds of letters where she is writing to people going, hey, do you think this is authentic? Do you think the value of this is right? What can you tell me more about this piece of manuscript? And she really worked and built up these amazing relationships with scholars, professors throughout the world to understand the pieces in our collections better. And then one of our last pieces I have here is our mutual friend, Charles Dickens, we have a very strong Dickens collection, thanks in part to Green and her collecting practices. And then I just have some numbers on the screen here. When she left the Morgan or retired in 1948, in that exhibition, they list this as the her kind of numbers that she did between just when we went public. So just between 1924 and 19. 48. And I some well, I'm going to point out the 138 illuminated manuscripts might not seem like a lot, but illuminated manuscripts went for thousands of dollars. So the fact that she had collected 138 of them during this time is really remarkable. The 31 Rembrandt etchings is another amazing number, considering the Morgan has the largest number of Rembrandt etchings in North America today. Um, and she always went after the best states, they're called. Um, um, so it was just which ones looked the best. And so she really would, she would send back ones that she was just like, and eh, this one's not as good. Let me try getting this one that's better and really had a foresight for finding the best of the best. And then in her time here at the Morgan, she held 46 exhibitions, which is a lot of exhibitions, especially for a new, um, an up and coming public institution at the time and kind of harkens to the Morgan's exhibition schedule today, which is a very fast moving one um, and one of the busiest um, in New York City museums today. Um, and uh, one of the things I love about Green that I love to share with people is Green's views on access. Green was a pioneer when it came to how special collections interact with the public. And so this is just a newspaper article where she was using our medieval textbooks, um, textbooks, our museum, our illuminated manuscript as textbooks for university for college students. And this is an idea that really was just not at the time done, which is why it got a newspaper article about it. The fact that these students could come in, they didn't just weren't told, they weren't just showed, they got to handle these works of art and really get to interact with them, which was something really new. And Green really was at the forefront of this idea of using, of making sure that our institution was a place where students could really, you dive into this material, you can see photos of our reading room at the time when Green was at the Morgan. And one of my favorite things is she's actually communicates with a library in California and she says to them, you know, how do we share documents? How can I make copies of my books and send them to you? And you make copies and send them to me because I don't believe that students should have to spend a fortune crossing the country to study this material. And so she really already, at a time when this wasn't talked about, believed in equitable practices within the special collections field, which is something we still are, you know, are working out today in the field. So she is this pioneering woman who fought for access. She fought for higher pay for women librarians. She mentored many of the women that worked at the Morgan, offering them, you know, chance to move higher up in the field and really believed in the profession being a passion and not just a job. Um, one of these women she mentored was Helen Frank, and this is a letter to Green, not from Green, um, where Helen Frank talks about having to leave the Morgan to go um, serve in World War II. Most of the Morgan employees do leave to go serve in World War II. Green actually stewards our institution through both world wars. Um, the First World War we didn't have um, any staff leave, but she knew many of the dealers um, over in Europe and was constantly writing back and forth to them, asking if they were okay. 
do they need help? What do they need? She leads the efforts to help rebuild the Louvain Library in, in, oh, I always get it wrong. I'm gonna say Switzerland. That's wrong though. And I apologize. <laughs> I have to get the right country on that. Um, but she helps spearhead the work in rebuilding that. And in World War II, we see this even more when so much of our staff leaves and they're right, you know, she, they, we have Helen Frank writing this incredible letter about remembering coming to the Morgan for the first time, meeting Green for the first time. But now she says, you know, we have to put these things away in order to go serve our country. And Green has many um, contacts over in Europe. She helps again with the recovery efforts. She's selling war bonds. She really makes it a point to care about what happens to collections at this time we send most of ours away she communicates with some of the monument men who are the men and women who go overseas and are on the front lines trying to rescue art and we have these great letters with green to one Ernest T. DeWald where he's like I think we're gonna lose this art he's the Nazis are coming in I don't know what we're gonna do and he's dreaming of just coming back home and having a drink with her and so it really is a poignant point in her life was stewarding the institution through the war. Um, and this is the letter with Ernest T. DeWald where he's talking about being on the front lines and then having that drink with her, which I just think, you know, he talks about having a martini. So now we know she likes martinis, um, which I just think is, or a highball, which I just think is a really, you know, beautiful but sad moment um, of the war. We do know that um, Ernest Tudewald comes home safely and actually after the war in the late 1940s is integral to getting some of these key pieces of art back to where they belong, um, which is just an amazing story. Uh, Green not only collected for the Morgan, she had a, a fairly vibrant art collection of her own. These are just three pieces that were in her collection that are now housed at the Morgan. Um, we don't really know any rhyme or reason to why she collected what she collected. Um, she definitely, I point out the middle drawing in the middle here, <clears throat> excuse me, which is from Iran. She tried to push the Morgan into buying um, non-Western art and manuscripts. She really had an affinity for these materials. Unfortunately, Jack was just not super interested in them. We do have some pieces, though, in our collection that she was able to get in, um, but she did collect some for herself as this leaf that's here. She had this Albert Durer Melancholia engraving, which I'm just a huge fan of the, <laughs> the Durer print. Um, and then this other work, which is an anonymous French school painter, which is just a really pretty um, work of art, but we have no information on or why she collected it. Um, so here are just two letters. Um, at the top here, Dear Thirsty is a letter to her former secretary, Ada Thurston, who was actually Green's first hire um, at the Morgan in 1906. She hired her um, and would Thirsty would be at the Morgan with her up until the 30s when she had a child um, and resigned, but they stayed close friends. But in this letter, we they're talking about the death of Jack Morgan. Um, and I just, there's something really poetic about the top. And they're talking about how they went through these two wars <clears throat> and now the death of Mr. Morgan. This period in 1943 of Green's life is really tumultuous. She will lose her mother in 1938. She loses Jack Morgan in 1943. Between this, she'll also, lose the professor, um, Father Henry Hibernat, who worked with her on her, the Morgan's Coptic manuscripts. She considered him a confidant, um, and they had an amazing relationship from 1912 until his death. She really did consider him almost family. She'll lose him. And then in 1943, in the war, she'll lose her nephew, Bobby, who she had actually adopted and helped raise. Um, so she really is at a really hard point in her life at this moment. Um, and so this letter to Thirsty really kind of allows us to kind of get a glimpse of a more personal side of her that we don't often get to see because so many of her letters, while personal, are professional um, and don't dive deep into things like 
um, her feelings on her family, on race, and things like that. So this, you know, this letter is kind of one of those few where we get a glimpse at who she was. Um, and then the letter on the bottom is from 1949, and it's the last letter she'll ever write to her staff when she retires. <coughs> And I love the fact that she thinks she says she'll miss most is the staff. And she really embodied, she saw the Morgan as a home. She saw the Morgan staff as her family. There are wonderful stories about all of the staff bringing their kids to come visit. And I mean, we don't think of the Morgan today as being super child friendly. We think, you know, of this very gilded age. But now I want you to imagine it with just children running around the Marble Hall. Um, Green would often take out works to show them. There's a wonderful story that she actually took one of our old Mesopotamian cylinder seals and got clay and rolled it out for the kids so they could see how it works, um, which is another image of Grill Green that we don't normally have. Um, and so she really you know, I think it's important to note that in the dear staff part of the letter, she put staff in quotes um, because it wasn't staff, it was family. And I it's something that we at the Morgan today are really trying to showcase when it comes to Belle Green. There's often an image of her as the strict boss who like, you know, knew everything and was hard to get to know. But to them, she was a librarian and that's how she saw herself. And she was a friend and a mentor. And she really believed that to be at the Morgan, you had to have a passion for its collection, but you had to have a passion for everyone you worked with also, um, which I think is just a beautiful sentiment that we don't get to know about her very often. And this letter, courtesy, um, is in the Bernard Berenson letters at Itati. Um, and it's written by Meta Harson, one of other Green's mentor mentees um, who Green hired at the Morgan in the early 1920s and would actually go on to become the curator of illuminated manuscripts after Green retires, as decided by Green that Meadow was the one to take on this position and follow in her footsteps. Um, and she's writing to Bernard Berenson about the death of Belle Green on May 10th. Um, and it's just a beautiful sentiment when she says, so I feel there was a great rejoicing in heaven when she met Bobby and both Mr. Morgans and old Professor Havenot and all the others. And again, we get this glimpse that we don't often get with Green about who she was as a person and not just a librarian and director. Um, and that's because Meta Harson really didn't know her very, very well. Um, and so it's just, you know, a beautiful goodbye that we get to see here and know that her funeral was well attended. Green does die of cancer. Um, she gets starts getting sick and has a stroke in the 30s and her health only declines ever more throughout the 1940s. So it was not that surprising um, when she would pass away in 1950 to those who knew her. Um, and this is the last known image of Green taken in 1948. She is sitting at Morgan's desk in the West Room because at this point when this photo is taken, the new director's already been hired and he's working out of the North Room. So she's finding other places, but she can't give up the Morgan. She has to come in. Um, so here she is sitting at the very desk of the men who often get so credited with everything at the Morgan when she is just as and well, it's because of her, they get all of this credit because she very much pushed forward all of the efforts they made, but she is just as integral to the building of the Morgan. And here she is sitting at the restroom desk. And we do know that the book she's looking at is that Anne Holt Gospels, which was her second to last acquisition she made before she retired. And I just end with this quote where she says, I'm interested in how you say you don't on libraries in general, I do not but I do on this one and would very much like to sh show you through it. She, at the end of the day, wanted nothing more than to be known as a librarian. She actually says it to a newspaper reporter when they're saying, you know, you know, oh, do you want to be known as director? You know, and she says, like, the British Museum wants me to say that I'm curator of manuscripts. I'm this and I'm that. And she goes, I'm just a librarian. And I mean, we know she was not just a librarian. She was so much more than that. Um, but I think it's really just a sentiment to how she viewed herself and the work she was doing at the Morgan 
And I think this quote, just when she talks about showing someone through what she would often call her library is just a beautiful sentiment. Um, and I am going to end there. Um, there is so much more to say about Bell Green, but it's really hard to do it in small chunks of time. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions you might have um, on who she was, her work, um, or where we're still going with our research at the Morgan to bring her to life. We are in the midst of planning a major exhibition on her life and legacy that will open in 2024, in November of 2024, um, that will bring, that will start with her, her birth in Washington, DC, and take you through um, her move to New York, and then her amazing career as a special collections librarian. Um,